Great. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Using Local Momentum to Drive State and Federal Policy Change. My name is Ikra Haji and I'm a manager at CADCA's Geographic Health Equity Alliance. The Geographic Health Equity Alliance, in partnership with CounterTools, is excited to present today's webinar, which is the second webinar in our three-part local control series designed to equip attendees with an understanding of why local policy solutions are important, lessons learned from local policy implementation efforts, and innovative policy strategies built at the local level. The Geographic Health Equity Alliance, or DEER for short, is a CDC-funded national network dedicated to reducing geographic health disparities related to tobacco and cancer. GEO provides free training and support to state tobacco and cancer control programs and their partners on how to reduce health disparities and improve the health of communities across our nation. We encourage you to visit our website, geohealthequity.org to learn more and subscribe to our monthly newsletter, which will keep you up to date to our latest webinars, resources, and training opportunities. Our partner, CounterTools, is a nonprofit that works with partners across the country to advance place-based public health by implementing and enforcing policy systems and environmental changes that promote health equity across communities. Much of their work aims to reduce the detrimental impact of unhealthy substances such as tobacco and alcohol at the consumer's primary point of exposure and access, the retail environment. Today's webinar will discuss examples of tobacco control policy strategies that have had success at the local level in building support for wider initiatives. We'll bring together leaders from the field to share insights on how their work at the local level helped drive policy change across the country. I'm sure we all are pretty familiar with Zoom by now, but I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. All participants are muted by default. So for general comments, please use the chat box. We will have a Q&A portion at the end of the present presentation. So for any specific questions for the presenters, please use the Q&A box. Following this webinar, you will be redirected to our brief evaluation survey. We kindly ask that you take a moment to fill out the survey as it really helps us improve the quality of the trainings that we provide. You will also receive a post-webinar email with the recording of the webinar, slides, and registration information for webinar number three in this series. And the link for the evaluation survey will also be included there as well for anyone who missed it here. Letters of attendance are given um, only upon completion of the evaluation survey. I'd like to now introduce our presenters. Andrew Smith is a Southern State Strategist for the American Non-Smokers Rights Foundation. She has worked in the nonprofit sector for more than 20 years, helping organizations and communities build their capacity for sustainable change. She has provided technical assistance on grassroots advocacy, coalition building, strategic planning, and fundraising. Throughout her career, Anjua has helped develop strategic alliances between local coalitions, community-based organizations, stakeholders, and decision makers. Next, we have Ginny Chadwick, who is a program coordinator for the Missouri L Eliminate Tobacco Use Initiative at the University of Missouri, where she works around the state to improve tobacco policy prevention and cessation services on college campuses and in hospital systems. Since 2013, Ginny has worked on sales restriction laws for tobacco products. She has written ordinances and statutes and contributed to the national model language. She was, she was a legislative sponsor for one of the first Tobacco 21 policies to pass locally and the first in her home state of Missouri. She worked across the nation at a local, state, and federal level to help build coalitions, identify legislative champions, and successfully pass policy. Gina received her MPH and MA in journalism at the University of Missouri and is currently working on a PhD at Brandeis University. Last but certainly not least is Dr. Barry Hummel. Dr. Hummel is, a co is the co-founder and CEO of the Quit Doc Research and Education Foundation. After completing his pediatric training at the University of North Carolina and spending time in California working in the medical support services and research fields, he moved to Florida in 2005. Since then, he has used his skills to tackle tobacco addiction and has been instrumental in developing tobacco awareness and prevention programs for children and teenagers in Florida. I will now pass it over to Anjul. Hey, so I think you guys can hear me and make sure I'm loading up the right thing and you can see the PowerPoint, correct? All right. Yep, that's perfect. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm really glad to be here today um, and sitting through those introductions. These are the times when you really wish you had taken better advantage of the fact that you can write your own bio and introduction. Um, I should get more creative about the things I say about myself. But um, 
I'm, I'm really thrilled. And I just want to give a quick shout out to all the folks from the Southern states that are on this call. So I appreciate you guys um, and hope this is helpful for everyone involved. So I'm going to share a little bit about um, smoke-free policies and um, how smoke-free policies have been very instrumental in success at the local, the state, and at some point, the federal level um, in, a, in a number of different ways. And so um, just a little bit about ANR. Um, ANR and the ANR Foundation, you guys may be familiar with our organizations. Um, we're sister organizations. Um, ANR Foundation was established in 84. And we provide a number of tools and resources that um, we hope that have been helpful in the field. Um, we're the group that um, provides the model smoke-free language. So a lot of folks refer to it as the model ordinance. Um, we send out and collect and update maps and lists. And um, we, we try to track smoke-free policies in a number of different environments and make that um, available to everyone so that you know what's going on across the country and that you have the tools to not only track the industry, to develop messages, but to sort of build your capacity to do this work in a number of environments in a number of different places. Um, our sister organization, Americans for Non-Smokers' Rights, also um, provides a number of tools and resources. Um, and we, we do the model ordinance, we talk about deal breakers, we share about the fundamentals of smoke-free policies. All of those resources can be found on our sister site, nonsmokersrights.org. Um, and together, we address this issue in a number of different environments. We work, um, you most know us for working with workplaces, restaurants, bars, multi-unit housing, casinos and gaming environments, um, colleges and universities. Um, we really take on this issue um, in any environment where we believe, and that's every environment, right? Where folks have a right to smoke-free air. But to really get a sense of and to understand how local smoke-free efforts have really laid the foundation for broader, a broader impact, kind of got to understand a little bit about how this, this movement really started. And it literally started with a local effort in Berkeley, California. And um, uh, two groups got together. So you guys may be familiar with Groups Against Smoking Protection, um, uh, Smoking Pollution, um, an organization called GASP. And they've got, uh, had branches across the country, um, but they had a, a, quite a bit of a presence in California. And um, uh, some smoke-free advocacy organizations in Northern and Southern California that got together and formed an organization called Californians for Non-Smokers Rights. Um, and their very first effort was um, kind of launching a statewide campaign, but at the same time really working on getting smoke-free environments in Berkeley, California. And while I won't go into detail about um, this timeline, you should just know that so much has happened over the years. Um, it's been 45, 46 years of work for us um, with that movement starting back in Berkeley, California, um, to get to where we are today. But so much has happened along the way, and the timeline is really interesting. And all of those pieces have to sort of fall in place for us to be able to build this momentum, to protect folks from smoke-free, um, secondhand smoke exposure, and to continue to strengthen and raise the level of expectations for what we're able to pass in terms of policies across the nation. Um, and again, that organization, Californians for Non-Smokers Rights, became Americans for Non-Smokers Rights as those efforts at the local level started to really branch out across the country. And um, we needed to sort of uh, represent how this was trending across the nation. So let's take a quick look at sort of how this started and how it's going. So um, the smoke-free movement really started with some local policies really bubbling up in California and in Massachusetts. And looking at sort of the extreme ends of this country, um, but this is really sort of the foundations for kicking off this movement. 
And while this map represents what happened or what was uh, ha would have happened by 2000, policies were being passed um, in a number of different places up until then. This map represents those 100% smoke-free policies covering workplaces, restaurants, and bars. But you see where this sort of started. And then just five years later, this is a map for two, oh, hang on, sorry. Um, 2005, where you see some similar movement, it's still happening in California and Massachusetts. We start to see some efforts locally in places like West Virginia and Colorado, and even in places in the Southern states. We see a lot of local movement in Georgia and even Texas. And then um, shortly we'll start to see some movement in some of these other places. But this is where things were sort of um, at the time. And you'll see some of the states that are colored. Um, the only two comprehensive policies, statewide policies at the time are Massachusetts. And because Massachusetts just really had this, this burst of local policies um, that really helped them get a comprehensive smoke-free law. And then New York, because it's New York. And New York pretty much will do what it wants to do, right? So, but some key events happened. So that was 2005. And in 2006, the Surgeon General's report um, on secondhand smoke was released. And I don't know if you guys remember just how pivotal this was in the process. And it just really launched a flurry of comprehensive policies because we had sort of this, um, this expert backing, right? This authority saying that sections and then uh, sections and enclosed rooms and these separate space, spaces just would no longer work. And so there was more of a willingness to pass comprehensive policies. So we see all these local wins between 2006 and 2010. And then midterm elections happened. And I don't know if you guys could make this connection between midterm elections and this really sort of full stop on statewide laws being passed, but I see a connection. And we really truly haven't passed a, a statewide law since then outside of North Dakota by ballot in Indiana, which accept, uh, exempts bars and casinos. But in the meanwhile, even though statewide policies and laws being passed had been stalled, we still saw this incredible movement at the local level. And from 2010 to current day, we're just still really kicking butt and taking names and doing work at the local level. And then seeing how this is really helping to influence and set the foundation for smoke-free protections in a number of environments. So right now we're sitting on 1,157 municipalities that have a law in place that covers all workplaces, restaurants, and bars. That's just the what we would call comprehensive policies. And you'll see that reflected in all the, the circles and triangles on the map. 28 states, along with the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands, have a law, a state law, um, covering all three of those environments 100%. And all of that equals to 62.5% of the population covered by a law. And so the work is having its impact, right? We're also seeing some of this local momentum um, re represented in other environments. Um, there's a lot of local activity, as you may know, to really regulate the use of electronic cigarettes and whether they're passing new laws or strengthening existing laws to make sure that those spaces continue to be smoke-free. We are also seeing um, a lot of local movement with respect to colleges um, and university campuses in passing uh, smoke-free and tobacco-free policies. But sort of this idea of local progress and local momentum um, keeps sort of um, having its, its impact. Now, one of the things we wanna keep in mind when we talk about sort of state level and local level progress is that many states are preempted from doing work at the local level. And I know you guys have had conversations about preemption, but preemption, um, although it limits the work, doesn't mean that there's not work happening. And so many of these states and many local communities continue to 
educate, continue to increase smoke-free protections in different environments. And that work is still continuing. And that's something that's really important um, as a theme throughout of this is that you know, the work never stops. So let's take a closer look at a couple of uh, states and see how sort of they've done the work over the years. So looking at Massachusetts, um, it, Massachusetts continues to be sort of um, the rock star in the movement, right? And just really, really exemplifying how local momentum really does carry over into a strong statewide law. So a lot of that work really started to bubble up in 94 and 95. They really start to see some local mo momentum. But between 98 and 2004, there's just there's more than 100 local ordinances passed. And if you were to go to our uh, website where we show a chronological list of all the ordinances that have passed in the country, whether they were comprehensive or not, like we track them and list them all. You'll see in this, this window of time, they're all pretty much from Massachusetts or California. They dominated the work at the time. But um, some noteworthy wins uh, came from Boston and Cambridge and Somerville. And shortly after that, um, the statewide law was passed um, in 2004. And um, that law covers bars, restaurants, and non-hospitality workplaces. And so, you know, doing work that we do in the Southern states, that in states that don't have a strong smoke-free law, you know, we like to say that, okay, we don't have a strong law, but we're doing the work at the local level to make sure that we get a strong law passed. Um, and so that work continues. Another um, example of local leading the way is the work that has happened over the years in California. Um, and the first attempt really was way back in 77 when there was a statewide attempt that failed um, in California. And even though that was happening, the work was still going on at the local level in Berkeley and trying to get that ordinance passed. So even though the state law, uh, uh, the campaign for a state law launched first, the ordinance for Berkeley passed first. Um, there was a second attempt in 79 for a, Calif for a statewide law that also failed. Um, but they kept moving and, and working on local ordinances, passing more than 75 at the local level before they eventually got to a statewide law in 98 and closed some loopholes, I think back in 2016, to remove some uh, workplace exemptions and finally really get on our own list for um, a comprehensive smoke-free law in California. But they did a ton of work at the local level. I wanna also talk a little bit about Louisiana. And Louisiana does not have a strong law, but they're doing a ton of work at the local level right now with 31 um, local ordinances. And you'll see the timeline of work here, and you can see how some of that's reflected in some of the things that we talked about. Um, but the work continues, and, and Louisiana will continue to do the work until we get to that state law. But we're gonna continue to work and pass those local ordinances. A state law is always part of the end game. Um, for, for every state on here, um, no matter where you are in the process, we know that the state law, getting a state law is the end game, but local, com local momentum is a strategy that'll get you there. We would encourage that you don't abandon the local efforts to pursue a, state like a statewide law. Both things can happen at the same time. And over the years we've seen where folks turn to work on state law and they totally stop working at the local level. But the local work is what really helps to shape those social norms. And it helps to raise expectations so that you have this broader commitment to the bigger picture. And practice makes perfect. Like use these local opportunities to, to practice how you address opposition, to really work on organizing and to really work to get things right. Some of the best practices that we've seen out of those states that have been successful and those that are still working on, on getting there um, is that they've used local efforts to build their power, to really do some quality organizing in target communities um, and really sort of build this network of support across the state that will really um, 
pan out to be this really just powerful voice by the time you get to wanting to being able to do something at the state level. You get more bang for your buck. And if you've got limited resources, instead of spreading yourself thin and trying to make that work across the state, really focusing in on some target communities where your resources, whether they're human or financial, can have um, a greater impact. And of course, being able to protect folks with a strong policy in those places. But local campaigns and that local momentum really also offers the opportunity to recruit and train local champions. And we know how important it is when you get to the state level to be able to have this representation of people and organizations and stakeholders and just voices from across the spectrum. But your local campaigns help to build that. And whether it's policymakers or bar owners or service industry workers, musicians and entertainers, and just those community advocates and voices from, from across the state, that stuff starts at the local level. And so use those local opportunities, not just for that one place, but so that you can connect the dots for getting to your end game. Don't stop talking about the issue. Um, one of my uh, favorite campaigns is um, the work that's happening in Louisiana. And again, whether they, they have a, a, an ordinance or a statewide campaign active, they're always talking about the issue. They will not let decision makers or the community in Louisiana forget that there are still folks exposed to secondhand smoke. And they have a state law that covers workplaces and restaurants, but not bars and casinos. I think that's right. So they need to continue to do the work. And it's really easy to forget that some of these folks are still working in these smoke-filled environments, but they won't let it, they won't let it rest. And they're going to continue to put this out there and be public about it so that when the campaigns come, they've already really laid the foundation for doing this work. And they're recruiting and they're organizing and they're educating. And hopefully they'll be able to continue to put all those dots to together for really strong campaigns. Local policies just really have powerful momentum and you can really do some meaning, meaningful local community change. Um, it really helps to respond to the pulse of the community. Um, what does this community need? And let's respond to that. You build trust, you build credibility, and it really helps you moving on to the next one. These local campaigns help to ensure decision-maker accountability. They're really accessible and should be way more accountable to their local constituents. Um, these local campaigns really make it, uh, should make it easier to enact strong and effective laws. You can really pass policies that um, are, are relative to the community and, and for what's represented there. Um, but you should have less industry interference. And I know there's probably some folks laughing at that because we've seen some communities, some locals really have to fight the power on this, right? And really get some interference. Um, but then compliance should also um, be a little easier. And then um, every community is different. Be sure to go through your community assessments, your coalition assessments, determine your deal breakers, determine how you will address outreach and communication, really figure out what your opposition is because it might be different in different communities. Outreach to local officials, the local media, and then figure out what your readiness checklist is. This is standard, but don't move forward at any level, local or statewide, without being able to say that you've got community support, stakeholder support, that you can counter opposition arguments, and that um, you've got decision maker support. And stay encouraged. Like, celebrate your accomplishments, acknowledge your challenges, and continue to increase um, smoke free protections. Um, the work, the finish line is ahead, um, but, and it's frustrating, you guys, we know it is, but continue to work and, and celebrate moving down the path and on your way to the finish line. And we will be here to support you guys in any way. Thank you. So I will turn this over um, and we'll be available for questions later.
Thanks, Anjul. Really great to set up hearing about tobacco control from the smoke free perspective and, and, you know, kind of leading into tobacco 21. And, and um, so just to give you a little bit of background on how the tobacco 21 movement went from um, the state to local level, I just want to make sure with everybody that the, the, the non um, presenter mode is, is displayed, correct? Excellent. Great. Thank you. So Tobacco 21, the idea whose time has come. That was actually the title of a New England Journal of Medicine article that came out in January of 2014. I remember the day well um, by Jonathan Winnicott. And at that point in time, um, there was only nine local policies. So New York City had just passed Tobacco 21 in, in November of 2013. And I, I really say that that's when the eyes of the nation hit this policy. It wound up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and, and that's when I got involved in it. So um, by the end of 2013, we had nine policies. The end of 2014, we had 50 local policies. End of 2015, we had 100, so it had doubled. Um, and then 2016, 201 state. And so as I mentioned, I was um, I got involved in it when New York City passed. A school board member called me and said, I want to get tobacco out of my high schools. And New York City just did this thing. And um, I'm in Columbia, Missouri. And I said, Jonathan, New York City, it, Columbia, Missouri is not New York City. And so um, he was like, yeah, but I think that we can do this. And so when we started, um, New York had local policy, Massachusetts had local policy. Um, by the time we passed the policy, um, Hawaii had one county with a local policy and Illinois had one jurisdiction with local policy. And so we added Missouri to that list. Um, so we were the fifth state with a local policy in place. Um, and you know, there was a lot of warning uh, by uh, people involved in, in local and in, in tobacco control policy that maybe we should be concerned to move local policy in Missouri, um, because if we passed a local policy, we might get preempted at the state level. And so there was thoughtful timing on when we passed the local policy. We actually passed it while the um, legislative session was out of uh, was out um, so that hopefully there wouldn't be a preemption bill put forward. Um, and then we knew once we passed that local policy, that one local policy, we couldn't let it stand on its own. So we started moving very quickly to um, pass policy across the state of Missouri. So Kansas City and St. Louis actually went before Boston did. And as we hear, you know, Massachusetts was leading the way on Tobacco 21, just like they were smoke-free indoor air. But our major metro areas were, were taking off and going um, at full speed. So to get to where we did um, in, in passing policy in Missouri, some things happened. Um, the Sinar Amendment was one of the first um, national tobacco control bills that passed, really telling the state that it needed to send, set a minimum age. And um, in using a carrot and the stick um, incentive to make sure that the states did that. Um, the next federal policy that, that passed on tobacco um, age restriction was the Family Smoking and Tobacco Prevention Control Act. It set the age at 18, but it gave the states explicit authority to um, make that more stringent in, in local government entities too. And so that non-preemption clause within the Family Smoking Tobacco Prevention Control Act dictated down to the states and local governments that they could um, make laws more stringent. And then when the um, Tobacco 21 law passed um, and was signed in December of 2019, um, it retained that non-preemption clause, again, giving the states the authority and local governments. But that didn't mean that every state had the authority, that, that local communities in every state had the authority. It really depended on state statute. And so we were very fortunate in Missouri as we first started to contemplate moving local policy, that our state had specific language that said nothing shall prohibit the local political subdivisions from enacting more stringent um, ordinances and rules. 
So that clear non-preemption clause, that authority of local community was what made my city attorney comfortable when I said, hey, Nancy, I wanna pass Tobacco 21. I'm gonna draft this ordinance um, to raise the sale age. She said, let me look at state law. And she came back and she said, we've got the green light, you know? So, 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 so much important um, information in, in, in law happens, you know, above us to, to allow that local movement. You know, there's a national Tobacco 21 um, model language and in that model language, um, you know, whereas states are pursuing, um, they want to make sure local jurisdictions have the authority to, to move forward that, that that's not taken away. So thinking about how Tobacco 21 diffused, and I love the maps on Jewel that you were showing of, of, of the dots, how they start to pop up. You know, Hawaii was the first state that we got to move. And, um, you know, we went from November 2013, New York City, you know, being the first major metro area um, to pass nine policies at the end of 2013 to December 2013. 19, we have a federal law. And while not, there's still 11 holdout states that haven't passed statewide laws, this really happened at a local level across the country. Um, so Hawaii County was one of those in those first, that first year of uh, passing um, those couple of policies. And I should say that the first policy actually passed in 2005 in Needham, Massachusetts, but nobody, nobody touched the policy for um, many years after that. Um, Massachusetts has an interesting um, structure of government in that their boards of health can vote on health policy. And so we see a lot of innovation out of Massachusetts because of the way that they're structured. So with Hawaii County being one of the first um, areas to pass, Hawaii was the first state to pass. And then we see California being the next state to go statewide. It also had local policy passed prior to the state passing. Then New Jersey was the third state to pass local policy, and they had been a champion of um, local policy for, for, for the first several years that the policy was moving. And so in 2017, um, New Jersey joined the list of implementing the policy um, with quite a few local policies. So I have had the great fortune because I sponsored one of the first bills in a conservative state. Um, I got to help communities across the country. Um, you know, either legislative sponsors or advocates would call me and say, how did you do it? And I would always say, oh, quite by accident. <laughs> but we did it, um, you know, working at the local level. As Angela said, building that coalition, um, bringing community partners together that we knew that would support it. Um, and passing it um, through a council that we knew we had the um, decision makers support. In looking at those first states that passed it, um, Hawaii, as I mentioned, had local policy. California had local policy. New Jersey had local policy. Oregon had Blaine County pass it. Um, Maine had a local policy. Massachusetts had dozens and dozens of local policies. And then looking at the states that we struggled to pass it in or, or that had more trouble. Let's look at the last three there. So Idaho, it, it wasn't clear um, that they could enforce it if they passed it in their state statute. And so local policy wasn't moving in Ohio, Idaho. Um, Michigan passed one local policy and it was challenged and um, the challenge um, was withheld by, or was held by the industry, won that lawsuit. And so um, and then Rhode Island was also uh, a state that was slower to pass local policy. Um, so those states that had um, restricted ability to pass local policy or um, less local policy moving, it's not always the case. Um, so, but a lot of times it is. So I, I wanna share Colorado. Um, so they had really good policy movement. Um, you know, Denver was one of the, the the mid-level, uh, I would say mid-time period policies to pass, but Denver did a really good job making sure their policy was really strong and uh, made sure that there was a lot of key components based on that model that would be included in the Denver policy. And, you know, when we look at the um, Denver policy, it talked about, you know, distance from schools. It, it, it gave, um, they were doing four compliance checks per retailer. 
And so when you look at the state policy and, and what components that made it in the state policy, um, you know, the state said that they would do at least two retail compliance checks, um, which was far better than we were seeing in, in many of the other policies um, that were passing at a state level. Um, they also had a 36 month look back period and that was mo in the model ordinance um, that made it into the, the national, um, or sorry, made it into the state level policy. And, and that was in part due to strong policies in the state that were including that 36 month look back period for violations. Um, Minnesota is another state that it just has a rock star statewide policy. And you will see that it jumps from 17 to um, to 54 in that first line. And they had passed 70 local policies prior to um, the statewide policy passing it. And they were really good and strong policies. And Minnesota has, um, you know, what I would say one of the model policies at a state level in the nation. Um, it has the 36 month look back period. It has mandatory retail compliance checks of every retailer. Um, it has a good penalty structure with license suspension and relocation. And we really saw the local folks on the ground with a lot of energy moving those local policies to help inform those state level policies. Utah was a state that I worked in very early. We actually thought it would be an early adopter of Tobacco 21. Um, I remember going and working with their youth back in probably 2015, and it was a policy that didn't move um, for quite a long time. There was a little bit of ambiguity on whether they could do enforcement. And so they didn't have a local policy in place. And unfortunately, when they adopted Tobacco 21, they preempted local communities from even being able to pass it in, in the future. And so there's real benefit to getting local policies in place to, to prevent preemption. We also see um, in Missouri, we have a lot of strong local policies. We have state legislators who continue to try to put preemption in the state law but it hasn't successfully passed. And that's because there's a huge groundswell of local policy and they have a lot more trouble politically moving forward with a preemption bill now. So I will pause there because I know that um, we have Barry that's gonna give an in, a little dive into Florida. I had the fortune of going to Florida a couple of times and, and, and helping with some language um, there in the past. So. Barry, I'm going to turn it over to you to share about the statewide effort in Florida. Thank you so much, Jenny. Yeah, Florida, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a success story and then a sort of a cautionary tale from our efforts here on um, exactly what's been discussed so far, which is using local initiatives to drive statewide policy and then maybe facing some blowback uh, in the long term as a result of that. So. Um, as everybody here knows that you can really support and implement successful policy initiatives locally and then draw attention to those issues among your statewide lawmakers. And that will help you gain some of those policies on larger scales. And you've seen that throughout the discussion today. But if you don't pay attention to the political climate at the state level, those grassroots efforts can sometimes energize opponents and then undermine or even thwart your statewide efforts. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a success story, and then a cautionary tale, as I said before. So I'm going to take you to 2014. At, at the time in 2014, we had a national age of 18 for cigarettes and spit tobacco, but other tobacco products had not been deemed as such by the FDA. So there were no age restrictions at the federal state level uh, for the purchase of electronic cigarettes and other liquid nicotine and other electronic drug delivery devices. So as a result of that, in Florida, there began a, to be a movement to try to get at least some local ordinances to put 18 as the benchmark for sales and purchase of those products. And using 18 as leverage, going into local policymakers and saying, hey, did you know that there is no age restriction on these? We could get them to talk about some of the other uh, issues around electronic cigarettes, for example, the use in parks and playgrounds, the use in restaurants, um, because we weren't preempted by the state to work on those issues like we would be with, say, uh, combustible smoking products in the state of Florida. So there was a great success throughout the state early uh, in 2013. And this map shows you 
uh, counties that had county resolutions. They included about four counties in the state and then uh, several, several cities as well, kind of sprinkled throughout the state. That led the state to pay attention to it because it had happened so very quickly. It happened in about a 12 to 18 month period of time. So in the 2014 legislative session, uh, the House Bill 169 and Senate Bill 224 were run to make the age 18 statewide. Uh, basically though, because the tobacco, because the electronic cigarettes and liquid nicotine had not been deemed as such by the federal government, they created a separate category in Florida statute for alternative nicotine products. Again, that was fair because the FDA hadn't really classified the products in any way. And then as a result of that, we had two parallel laws in the state of Florida. We had a tobacco statute and we had a, basically a liquid nicotine or, or alternative nicotine product statute. As this was happening, this went to the floor of the house. There was a last minute attempt in 2014 by Representative Frank Artiles to add preemption language that expressly preempts the state to the regulation to regulate the sale of products under this section and supersedes any municipal ordinance on the subject. What does that mean? The idea there was to preempt local communities from working on other electronic cigarette issues. So they're going to give us 18 as an age restriction but the rules on no smoking in parks, the rules on no smoking on restaurant patios, local community coalitions and tobacco prevention groups would not be allowed to work on those particular issues. Now, just to tell you the difference in the political climate 2014, this led to a lot of pushback by tobacco control groups from around the state. Uh, uh, this is a photograph of uh, on the steps of the Capitol uh, Brenda Olson from American Lung Association is uh, presenting there on the steps of the Capitol. I'm off to the side there in a tan jacket. So I, I attended that. I got to participate in a media event where local newspapers could call in and say, why is this a problem? There was a really well-organized pushback on the preemption clause. And ultimately, that preemption amendment was defeated on the House floor by a very large uh, a bipartisan vote. So the efforts of local coalitions individually led to a statewide age restriction. But the threat of preemption had already been raised. This was in 2014. Let's advance a few years, 2019. Local communities here now working on the Tobacco 21 issue that Ginny had just shared with us, uh, started to try to raise the age of both combustible tobacco products and electronic nicotine devices at the local level. And also create uh, tobacco retail licenses with a lot of partnership, by the way, with uh, Counter Tools, who's here with us today as well, to, to have better enforcement. And the, and the line I always use is you can make the age 100, but if you don't check the retailers, it doesn't matter what the age is. You have to make the, the enforcement of it substantive and punitive in order to make these things work. And the only way that can really be effective is if it's really local enforcement, because they have more eyeballs more frequently than a state agency like the Florida ABT would have. So the Tobacco 21 movement started as a local movement here in Florida as well. But unlike five years earlier, th this effort led to the introduction of this bill in 2019 that would preempt all those local government entities from pursuing uh, age of tobacco sales higher than 18. So they were going to set the age at 18 at the state level and tell local communities they could not raise it above that. And that would be for both, again, as I said before, combustible tobacco products and vaping devices. So advocacy efforts among the statewide partners and local coalitions managed to kill that bill in committee. We did not have that bill pass in 2019, which would have preempted our local work. Let's go to 2020. In 2020 in Florida, we had uh, the bill that actually ruled the day was Senate Bill 810. And this was uh, brought up in 2020 as a result of, again, local efforts to raise the age of 21, both at the city and county level, and require these tobacco retail licenses that I, meant, that I mentioned before. Alachua County was the first county in the state to adopt this policy. They did it. Uh, prior to the 2020 uh, legislative session. They had a uh, retail license that cost about $230. Uh, 
the funds were used to subcontract the enforcement to the same group that does it for the FDA. In fact, in the first wave of compliance checks, they determined that one third of the retailers were in violation of the Tobacco 21 statute or ordinance that was passed in Alachua County, incredibly successful program in Alachua County. Uh, then other communities such as Fort Lauderdale uh, had efforts to raise the age to 21. They did that without the uh, use of a tobacco retail license. They were gonna use code enforcement to do the compliance checks. So they didn't feel that a license was necessary. Martin County also did it uh, with a great um, enforcement piece as well. Everybody handled it a little bit differently, but everybody got the age on the books for 21 and also got better enforcement. But then, as you heard earlier in a surprise move, the Trump administration actually raised the age nationally for the sale of all tobacco products, and that included e-cigarettes and vaping devices, which had been deemed as tobacco products in the interim from the 2014 experience I shared. And so Tobacco 21 was the law of the land. It was in the interest of states, however, to raise the age because of some issues with maybe grants to the states to conduct tobacco prevention, prevention efforts. And so there was this movement to codify it in states who had not raised the age of 21. So in 2020, Florida decided to do that. And the state Senator David Simmons uh, introduced this leg legislation that I mentioned before to make the Florida tobacco regulations 100% consistent with the new federal regulations. It was basically codifying what the FDA had put in place. So it would have raised the age for tobacco sales at 21. It would have classified liquid nicotine and vapor generating devices as tobacco products consistent with federal law. And the key is it would have eliminated that duplicative law that we had mentioned earlier uh, back from 2014. And then as a result, any retailer selling liquid nicotine or vapor generating devices would have to get a tobacco retail license, which would at least increase enforcement from ABT. And because of some weird quirks in Florida law, they didn't want to put a fee on it. And so it would have cost the tobacco, I'm sorry, the vaping retailers, no charge. There would have been a free license. All they had to do was obtain the license. If you sold combustible tobacco products, you still had to pay the $50 fee. It was introduced with language to ban the sale of any flavored tobacco products in Florida that were also banned by the FDA. Those products should not be sold anywhere in the United States, but it was basically trying to match and codify the language. It passed overwhelmingly. Florida House passed at 99 to 17, by the way, in a Republican supermajority controlled House of Representatives. Same thing in the Senate, 27 to 9, again, in a, with a supermajority of Republicans in the Florida Senate. And then it was vetoed by Governor DeSantis in September of that year. And it was because of a last minute push by the vaping industry. They were not happy with uh, this at all. They, it would have been a free license. They raised the age of 21, which was already the law of the land. So why the push to do it? Because they didn't want to be looked at. They didn't want any oversight, even if it was ABT with their infrequent compliance checks. And they managed to convince the governor to do that. And in his statement about this, he specifically mentioned the flavored language because he, he, he said in the statement, it would almost assuredly lead to more people resuming smoking cigarettes and would drive others to the hazardous black market. And we all know that the black market is a canard uh, by the uh, tobacco and vaping industry. Um, you know, sort of like, we don't want to put any rules in place because it's going to lead to illegal activity. So we shouldn't do it. And, but illegal activity is illegal activity, right? So a black market means you could be caught, tried, prosecuted, et cetera. So that's just a canard by the industry. So the following year, 2021, the, the Florida Senate and House attempted to do it again. And it was introduced by Senator Travis Hudson uh, with identical language to the 2020 bill. It was basically, we passed this overwhelmingly, we're going to do it again and make the gover governor take another look at it. But what happened was it got basically hijacked by the vaping industry during the process. They had a much more coordinated effort as it went through the committee process. And so several amendments were introduced that clearly favored the vaping industry. And while the focus of the bill was to increase the sales and purchase to 21, that was the giveaway. Well, we're giving you 21, what else, why are you concerned about these other things? It did several other things to make sure that it was not really enforceable. 
we'll raise the age, but not look at anybody, right? It created a separate parallel statute for liquid nic nicotine and vaping products to make sure they were not classified as tobacco products, reinforcing the language from 2014. It created a separate retail license for those vape shops, again, at no cost to the retailers, but with no system to guarantee that the retailers would apply. Uh, as of last December, only 41 vaping retailers in the entire state of Florida had applied for this license. But here's where it got dangerous. They dusted off their preemption language and they put the language in there that basically said in both statutes, the tobacco statute and this new parallel vaping statute, that the establishment of the age for purchasing and possession and the regulation of marketing and sales and delivery of tobacco products is preempted to the state. So not only did they set it at 21 and say, you can't raise it higher, they also said, by the way, all that other tobacco prevention work you're doing, all those product placement ordinances, all those signage restrictions, all those retailer density things you're doing, or putting, making sure you can't put retailers within a thousand feet of schools, it's all null and void. They nullified ordinances throughout the state that we've been working on for the last 20 years by using preemption to do that. So despite opposition from every public health organization in the state, including those listed here, and including the Florida chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, this was signed into law by the governor. This one he thought was okay. And uh, folks from the American Cancer Society in some of the press after the fact said, in our view, doing nothing is better than this bill. Uh, if our goal is to really make sure that retailers are following the law, then preemption doesn't make any sense. So now in Florida, we are stuck with a preemption clause that really restricts not only our ability to work on tobacco 21 as an issue, but most ordinances in our local communities. So we need to do what's right for our local communities and we need to work on these kinds of prevention policies. Um, and as we do that, just be mindful that it may draw attention of state lawmakers and that can go one of two ways, right? It can be have positive or negative consequences depending on the political climate in your state. And you don't want to you want to be mindful of that. And in working on your local policies, try to make sure you're not getting yourself in a position where you may undermine some of your work down the road. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Elizabeth and uh, we'll take some questions. Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah, we got a couple of questions coming in the chat. I know we uh, are a little tight on time, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I see one question for Anjul. Um, have you seen other conversations about local control and public health, such as the conversations we've had around masks, have you seen those impact local tobacco control advocacy? Yeah, I think it, um, well, you know, it's just basically sets the mood. Um, and it, it's really sort of creating this tension and apprehension for whether it's generally public health policy or specifically these particular um, things. It's really sort of put a it's created some hesitation and, 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 you know, apprehension around some folks and wanting to get out there themselves or be exposed to it and just, you know, kind of willingness for the, 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 the pushback on it. But I think some of that has settled. Um, pe people are, are finding sort of ways to connect with the opportunities to do that work and just trying to sort of uh, see the bright side, but short answer, yes, but there's a lot behind that too. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question. I think this could be for anybody, but I definitely uh, think this is relevant to what Barry just talked about. Uh, any tips on how we get big tobacco out of decision making meetings? I was thinking about that, Elizabeth, when she put it in, because, you know, the World Health Organization has the convention framework that says, you know, tobacco shouldn't be there. But our National American Public Health Association organization says that, you know, the tobacco industry can come and be at our presentations and, and at our conference. Whereas, you know, tobacco control, as a journal has said, we won't publish industry um, information. And uh, the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco says we're not going to let industry at our conference anymore. The American Public Health Association you know, in their journal in July, defended putting the tobacco industry commentary in their journal. So until we get our national organizations to even say we're not going to let tobacco industry play, um, I think it's really hard to get tobacco industry out of the conversations of passing policy. Um, and so we, as all of us as public health um, professionals, can, can stand up for our national organizations and say no. 
no no tobacco industry involvement. Um, Andrew Barry, I'm sure you have thoughts and comments. On I that. would just say one of the strategies here in Florida has been the, the the actual industry itself works behind the scenes, but they've been very good at mobilizing individual retailers to show up at committee meetings and talk about how this is going to be like a fifty dollar license fee is going to put them out of business and this sort of thing. And they drive, you know, they say, I've driven 400 miles because this is so important to me. And they managed to flood the committee hearings and get that messaging out there. So it's a dual thing we're fighting, right? Because they get a lot of small time business people to go and testify at the committee hearings. But then they're having other conversations, I know, heart to heart talks behind the scenes that are probably uh, even more problematic. Anything else to add? Oh, here's a question coming in, I think. Uh, how can we organize to advocate for the ending of relations between big tobacco and federal agencies? That's a tough one, right? Because even when the Tobacco Control Act was passed, it was passed with tobacco industry, like the tobacco industry was at the table helping write those rules back then. And part of the problem with the rules as written are that a lot of the stuff has taken many, 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 many years to, to roll out as a result of that. Like we're still taking public comment even today, and I may have closed finally on menthol cigarettes finally being, and we're talking about 15 years after the Tobacco Control Act passed. And that's because of industry sort of uh, thwarting or slowing down the process, right? We don't have cigarette warning labels, graphic warning labels, because they started fighting, they wrote the bill, and then they started fighting that in 2012. And now it's 10 years later, and we still don't have the labels. And with each year that passes, we know that more and more children and teens get sucked into this. So it, it's, that's a tough one, because that I feel like that bill would not have passed without them being at the table, unfortunately. So there was advantages and disadvantages. We have a bill, but then we have a lot of we have a lot of hurdles within that bill because of the way it was written. Yeah, definitely a challenge. Uh, well, so we will make sure that we share this presentation and uh, the contact information for the speakers if there's questions uh, that come to you later that we haven't gotten to today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to Kellen Shelter just to close us out, but thank you to our speakers and thank you to all our attendees for joining today. Yeah, hi, thank you everyone. Um, just thank you to our presenters for your interesting and informative presentation. We appreciate your time, of course. And thank you to all of you as webinar attendees for your participation today. Before we wrap up, just a quick reminder that after this webinar, you'll be redirected to a brief evaluation survey. Um, letters of attendance will be given out up upon completion of the survey. And so we just kindly ask that you take a moment to fill it out. You'll also receive a post webinar email, which Elizabeth mentioned that will have the recording of the webinar, also the slides from today and then registration information for webinar three of this series, which lovely, it's on the screen. So that said, we hope to see you all at our third and final webinar of the series, which is titled Innovative Local Solutions in Public Health and will be on August 22nd. Thank you, have a great rest of your day and enjoy your weekends.